Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. How's everyone doing? You having a good conference so far? Very good. My name is Farouk Day um, from Stanford University. I um, uh, serve there as uh, Dean of Career and Experiential Education and uh, Associate Vice Provost. And uh, I have the honor of uh, moderating the, uh, an incredible panel today about transforming college career education um, for the future of work. And with me is uh, uh, Jeremy Padani from uh, the uh, collective, um, Career Leadership Collective. Career Leadership. That's right. Blanking out a little bit. Um, uh, Christine Krishvagara from uh, Wellesley College, um, Joe Testani from University of Rochester, and Cindy Parnell from Arizona State University. All these are really good friends of mine, and for some reason, I'm just blanking on their names. <laughs> I'm going, who are you again? It's, I think it's the effect of the stage. Um, we are having a really important conversation today about what higher education is doing to prepare talent for the future of work, and what are the transformations that uh, have been happening, that are happening, and that will continue to happen in the future. I want to give you just a little bit of background of what's been going on, um, not only in the last several years, but also in the last several decades. Um, university career uh, services um, have, have gone through lots of paradigm shifts over the last hundred years, and uh, every time uh, we go through an economic uh, transformation. The universities go through their own transformation also to adjust. Uh, so we have seen colleges and universities go through uh, uh, paradigms that were about vocational guidance. We have seen uh, uh, colleges and universities go through placement uh, paradigms uh, with placement centers, uh, with counseling and advising uh, uh, paradigms. With uh, uh, we've seen colleges and universities play a little bit into the networking world. And since the economic downturn of 2008, uh, there has been a, a very much of a push uh, to transform again and to try to reconnect and uh, build bridges uh, between universities and industry um, using uh, connections, communities, different types of models that, that bring more opportunities uh, to students. With that said, um, there's still a lot of work to do. There's still a lot of resistance. There's lack of resources. And that's what we're going to be spending time uh, talking about today. So I'm going to go right into it. We have um, uh, four leaders here who have been doing amazing work um, in their respective institutions. Um, and uh, uh, Jeremy is one of those. And not only he's done good work in his former institution, he's now helping uh, lots of universities transform their um, uh, career education models as well. Um, so I'm wondering what, what's happening in higher education today uh, relative to this. So we know how we got here. Uh, what are universities doing? What are the major challenges of, for college career centers that you're seeing? Um, Joe and Christine, maybe you can get us started uh, there. Thanks. 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 You're welcome. Um, so I think to, to Farouk's point, there have been these evolutions in career services and after the recession, there was a huge push from many universities and colleges to really transform and prioritize career education, right? Because they were getting pressure from legislators, pressure from parents, pressure from students, pressure from alums around the value of higher education and the return on investment. But I would actually argue that in the past few years, um, the pendulum has continued to shift again. And I think although schools and colleges are in fact still worried about employability, or career readiness from sort of a more abstract global level, um, they are pressured to focus on some new things right now, such as mental health um, on campus. They're really focused on diversity and inclusion, access and equity, and I think one of the challenges for career services is the lack of resources, as Farouk just mentioned. And for us to be able to stay relevant and to make sure that we have the needs that we need to be able to serve the students at scale, which is another challenge that we all have, is to be able to figure out how do we link to and connect to the things that matter to our senior administrators right now. And so if that is mental health and wellness, if that is access and diversity and inclusion, what do we need to do to show value and worth in those efforts? How do we make sure that we are contributing to our students' well-being and contributing to their knowledge base around those areas as well um, so that we can show how connected career education really is to every facet of the institution. I'll leave it at that and let yeah, Joe kind of take it from there. Thank you. Um, I think one of the other challenges is 
prioritization looks very different for a variety of institutions. What does that really mean and look like? I think at probably the institutions we represent, that might look differently. Um, but I think uh, the resources is definitely a key piece of it, but is it a strategic priority or initiative for the institution? Because it doesn't always have to be maybe financed a certain way, but if it's part of the, the mission or the vision of the institution and it's kind of that central theme for what the change or the future of the institution is, that's the critical part of it. I think there needs to be more university leadership at the highest level to set it as a strategic priority. Um, thinking about the partnerships they have maybe with other sort of needs of an institution or the students they serve, but there's such a wide variety and diversity of institutions that you know, we represent a very uh, specific kind of institutions in the, in the institutions that we work at, um, but there's such a diversity, at, but I think at the same time, what is the priority? How are they prioritizing that? Um, where do they put that at the forefront? And what does that look like in terms of serving or changing the structure or the systemic sort of structure with the, of career education within institutions? So I want to play devil's advocate, and um, uh, and I want to try to let the voice that sometimes we hear in, on our uh, college campuses emerge a little bit. Um, it's not the the college's or the university's responsibility for students to get a job. Um, I know if you're a parent in this uh, of a college student in this room, you're probably cringing at that thought. Um, I, but it is a voice that that sometimes we hear. Um, is it the university's responsibility to build uh, that bridge or to help students uh, connect to the world of work after that? But Cindy, what do you think from the perspective of Arizona State University? Do you feel like that's a responsibility? Do you feel like that that a university has to throw resources and, uh, and create that? And Jeremy, what are you seeing around the country from the consulting that you're doing with the universities that um, answers that question? Do universities even need career centers or career services to help students uh, connect with the world of work? So phenomenal question, and yes, to answer that question directly, yes, universities do need career centers to support students, and it is our fundamental responsibility. It's part of our charter as working towards the public good. But in saying that, I do think that career centers working in old models are going out the window. And instead, in that traditional model being that of career centers being the north star of the university where seniors walk in through the doors to receive that one-on-one -on -one career coaching from a master level career advisor for one hour at a time, that's out the window. And instead, career centers, it's on us, I believe, to create new models, integrated models, where we are a part of the fabric of the institution and university life. Mm -hmm. And so at Arizona State University, our career staff see our role as being more of a presence than a place. And our job, regardless of title, is to make sure that we're creating those meaningful connections and creating career, um, almost like communities, and integrating across the full network of the university and bringing together both internal and external stakeholders for the benefit of the student. Because here's the thing, at the end of the day, the student's success is a shared responsibility. Now, that's, that's a hard thing to do. So at ASU, in our career center over the last couple of years, we have fundamentally disrupted our staffing organization chart, you could say. And even the roles and how our defined roles for career advisors or the employer relations team is even played out. Mm -hmm. So let me give you an example. Um, our career advising team, um, they each are a liaison to a specific academic college or school. And what that affords them is the ability to build relationships with the faculty, with the associate deans, obviously with the students, but even internship coordinators and academic advisors. And so they're curating a network and they're able to help build the trust and the buy-in that a career center can be of value and bring that value add to them. At the same time, our career advisors actually carry a caseload of employers. And that's in an old model, something that wait, employer relations teams, they're supposed to be working with the employers. And career advisors, they're only supposed to be working with the students. But instead, we see and we know that employers and us as career advisors understanding what are the current employment trends, um, our team picks up the phone and has monthly conversations with a caseload of employers that are assigned to them. And they're asking questions. How are our Sun Devils doing in the job search process, in the interview process? 
And how valuable is that information when that career advisor can then go back to the academic college and say, here's how our students are performing point in time. Let's add or adjust programming and services to meet this gap. So I think career centers absolutely are needed and will be driving change for universities. Here's the other thing, I think. Um, career centers have a lot to offer universities, but university leadership in particular, I think there's two places where career centers offer that value add. We have access to employers, and a lot of them. <laughs> At ASU, just this month, we went over the 11,500 mark of unique employers recruiting at Arizona State University. Mm -hmm. How amazing is that when we're able to connect employers that are from all different sectors and industries to our students and to our academic units to help move their initiatives forward. But it also allows for us to create almost cohorts of students that are prepared and positioned to meet specific workforce needs. And that's a value add that we can bring to university leadership are those employer relationships. The second thing is data. Career centers typically do a very good job of collecting data, analyzing it, and interpreting it. So imagine if, and we're a handshake school, so I love handshake because I'm able to go in and I can tell the dean of our arts and design college, here's how freshmen, sophomore, junior, seniors, and even alumni are performing or engaged in career education, and here's where the gaps are. Mm -hmm. And then our career advisors can now come in and in their college relationships, create programs and events and services that meet those direct gaps. So yes, career centers are needed to advance university mm. um, initiatives. I, I love your response, Jer Jeremy. You talk to people who are not in career services in our world. Do they get it? Uh, do, they, do they feel the same way? What are you hearing? A little bit. I, I think we're at a fundamental shift in this long time era of come in and see us. So there's this mm -hmm. career center at a university that's sometimes two to six layers deep in the org chart, saying, come in and see us. And the problem is it's, it's not scalable, it, especially if that's the lead uh, marketing message, come see us, come see us, come see us. Mm -hmm. And they realize, even with the big staffs of some of the universities on stage here, up to 35 staff members, but I mean, how many students are at Arizona State, right? That's why I think I, I really, really like what you're saying about we have to shift our thing to be a hub. Um, but rather than just the hub, it's, uh, it's career everywhere. It's, I think we're going to usher in the era of the career competent campus because the buyers are demanding it. And I think, mm -hmm. that, I think that's what's, what's starting to happen is buyers are saying, we, we need excellent quality service. We're making college decisions based on this. We don't need to just know at the admissions process that you have a career center or that there are a few counselors that are really good at their job. We, we need to know that it is full student life cycle integration. Mm -hmm. And I think that it could become... If you remember about 15 or 20 years ago with multicultural competency, how we started using the language of, if you're going to engage the campus well, every faculty and staff have to have a certain level of multicultural competency, and that's good. And I think that the career competency could be at the same level. Because right now on everybody's college campus, there are career conversations happening everywhere. And so the more the universities are, are the, the ones that are on the leading edge anyway are leaning into saying, we need to be a career competent campus, not just have a good career center. So I think maybe there's a slight nuance there. Mm -hmm. I would just add on to that. I think in order to actually have what Jeremy's talking about, it requires that folks in our positions are actually at the table. Absolutely. And that can look really different institution to institution. So for some of us, like at Wellesley, I report directly to the president. And that speaks volumes around um, who I engage with, who my peers are, right? At some other institutions, you don't necessarily need to report directly to the president, but you do need to be involved in the right committees. You need to be engaged with the trustees. You need to be at the right tables. And so figuring out at your respective institutions, for those of you that are in higher education or those of you that are thinking about investing in higher education or career services, um, thinking about what's the appropriate structure so that you can actually mm -hmm. have the integrated model that we're all talking about up here. And I think when you, when you do that, it allows you to leverage the connections and the conversations that are happening. I would posit that career services is sort of like where admissions was a long time ago, right? Where it used to be embedded sometimes under like the provost's office or under other areas. And over time, universities and colleges realized that admissions was actually core to all of their work. And they had to think about recruitment and enrollment management in some different ways. 
right? And so now you have vice presidents for enrollment management, you have deans of admissions that are typically at the cabinet level. And they're engaged in conversation around curriculum, they're engaged in conversation around the student experience, right? And that's where career services needs to sit as well. We bookend that experience. In fact, we help to take over as soon as the student is admitted. Right? Our work begins the second the student is admitted. And if I quote my own dean of admissions, who's a wonderful partner for us, she said, I can't sell what you can provide unless you can actually provide it. Right? So the university and the college has to be able to support both philosophically as well as financially so that we can actually fulfill our mission. But it takes a certain level, I guess, of courage of leadership to yeah. put that at the forefront of an institution, right? Mm -hmm. So I think we're sitting up here because a par part of it is that our institutions had some courage to say, mm -hmm. this, is a, this is important. Yeah. Um, because without that, in, and really kind of really being innovative with what does it mean for our campus to look, what does it look like for our campus and really listening to students. And I think I mentioned at earlier panels today, you know, the leadership is the sort of mm -hmm. integral part of this whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, so if the university leadership is not there, then it all kind of falls apart, no matter how great of an advocate, career center person might be, or how faculty are on board, if it's not sort of put up at the front. I don't, I don't know if it happens, and I think that's the challenge like I, f I feel is facing a lot of higher education, um, is really listening as opposed to replicating. So yeah. like, oh, that worked at ASU, so I'm gonna take that, I'm gonna apply it to yeah, my institution, even though my institution is completely different than ASU is, but we're doing the same thing that ASU are doing, this, and they're one of the leaders in the field. That doesn't work, and I think it takes a little bit more of thought, it takes a little bit more strategy, yeah. it takes a little bit more sort of courage of leadership to say, what do we really want to commit to for our institution? And, I, and that's the fear I have with, I don't know if mm -hmm. there's enough of that happening across all of higher ed, you know, if it's 4,500 different types of institutions in the United States alone, is that really happening on a consistent level, you know, across a lot of those institutions where a lot of, our, a lot of those students are in desperate need of sort of that support and that leadership of a university trying to help them make better decisions about their careers. I, I, don't, I, would, I get nervous about that piece of it, I guess. I think the pain point of that is, uh, if you look at admissions, there's money. If you look at retention efforts, there's money. If you look at career services, what do we generate as far as revenue? Mm -hmm. Not that much, right? So we have to hook into a whole bunch of different places. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a real, you know, not, not to break down the university uh, priorities in only with monetary terms, but it, it's a reality that we mm -hmm. face as we're trying to move something larger here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I remember when we started, when, when this whole wave of transformation of college career education mm -hmm. started um, uh, almost 10 years ago now, yeah. when we started hearing all about it, um, uh, and, and, and we did a lot of that at Stanford. It was, a, it was about elevating um, the uh, positioning of uh, your career centers on your college campus. It was about reimagining um, how we work uh, with campus partners and with off-campus partners. It was about reimagining the work that we do from being transactional to being more relational and transformational and to be m m more about uh, um, outcomes. And, um, and it was about getting more resources. So all of the themes that you're talking about, I feel like we're, right now we're reaching a point where now it's about, it's about finding a way to integrate um, uh, everything that happens in the career preparation world um, within the curricular experience of students. What I mean by that is if we put ourselves um, in uh, the shoes of students, as they come into to, 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 to any college campus, they know which process they have to follow in order to uh, uh, register for classes. They, they can try to figure out what majors to choose or except based on advice that they get from peers or parents or advisors, et cetera. They know how to take classes. They know what steps to take in order to succeed, to get the A's, to get the grades. Uh, but then there is all of this experience that happens outside the classroom that they don't know how to piece together. This idea of integrative learning, you know, how, how do we pull it all together in order for them to prepare for uh, the world of work. So how can, this is what we don't see happen on college campuses yet. How can that happen? How can career education be integrated in the curriculum that it's part of your graduation um, process and even requirements? Um, and how do we scale that? How do we do that at scale? Um, I wonder if maybe, Cindy, you, you, you have some thoughts uh, about that at, at Arizona State um, um, and, and, and anybody scale. else. Yeah. <laughs> 
So I think ASU in our daily work, it's all about scale, right? So to answer your question, we're over 100,000 students right now right. online and on ground. So we have to scale in order to meet our students' needs. Um, I think I'll let Christine speak to the curriculum piece, but I can share with you how ASU is advancing scale and career education through those means. Um, it's a big trend right now on a national um, the landscape, and that is engaging alumni. I think that's a, um, an easier way to bring in expertise to help do the work that we do and to bring in additional curators of content. Uh, we're a People Grove school as well, and what I love about that platform is we're able to create programs that um, break down the large to the small and allow maybe a first generation student to connect with um, a graduate who was a first generation as well and to receive advice and a connection and build out their network. Um, but engaging alumni, um, it's a phenomenal way and that's a great way for development officers as well to, who are usually connected to academic colleges and schools um, to build relationships with the Career Center and together work to integrate alumni into to academic colleges. Um, I think another thing, obviously, just technology and that goes back to kind of the staff roles. Whereas career advisors used to spend a lot of time one-on-one -on -one career advising, they're spending more and more time better understanding um, and becoming almost masters of digital and technological platforms to be able to deliver information at scale. They spend quite a bit of time curating content and sending it out or raising it and surfacing it through software that's targeted and customized to certain career communities. Um, so scale is big at ASU. I think, Jeremy, you say it beautifully, um, something along the lines of being able, and we've adopted this since Jeremy came out and consulted with our group a little bit a few months ago, is we've learned to help non-professionals or people who don't necessarily do career services become an expert in one thing. And so an example of that is actually our student employment program at the university, and a lot of universities have student employment programs, but we've actually rolled out a program and have been integrated across the university landscape to be able to connect with people who supervise student employees, and not work with the student employees, but work with the supervisors and help um, them understand the NACE career competencies, kind of come up with that common language, and help the supervisor understand their role in professionally developing a student for their next steps away from ASU through their student employment experience. And we have a lot of examples of that. That's just one. I think the other things at ASU that we do well to help scale, ASU has created a platform called Pitch. It's a great way to create a digital um, career community, right? And so our career advisors are able to surface a question or a resource or a topic and it allows for conversation to swirl and to happen. And it's amazing to see what else is shared um, in that community by other people. They're sharing connections to other people that they may know. Some, they, they like to share, sometimes they overshare. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of connection and sharing that happens where the career advisor is involved but isn't fully the owner. And so I think being able to scale is also creating these types of career communities. And you can do that by career interest areas, you can do that by geographic location. There's a lot of different ways to create these digital career communities. And lastly, at ASU, we have to go to where the people are. I can't expect 100,000 people to be coming into our career center. Um, we're lucky enough, we are afforded the um, resources, both through staffing and through budget, to allow for us to be creative. And so I, I have some of our leadership here today, and um, we send our teams to go to where our students are. We actually just created a brand new position that um, reports into our area, but it's a role that she lives in Seattle and she focuses on everything Western region, our online students, our employers, our alumni in the Western region of, of the US. So we go to where our students are, both physically on our campus, we're not expecting them to come into us, as well as we travel to meet their needs as well. Mm -hmm. I'll jump onto that, I think some of the things that um, we've really been exploring and thinking about. Obviously, Wellesley is in a very intimate uh, population in comparison to, to Arizona State. Um, but I think when you're talking about scale, every college, every university has to think about it in relation to their own culture and what that looks like and what the expectations are for the students that are there, right? So my students choose to come to an elite liberal arts institution because of the personalized touch 
right? That's why they're choosing a school like ours. So when we think about scale, we can't think about it from the same standpoint as when I was at George Mason University where I was serving 34,000 students and that was not the expectation of the students there. That approach and that thinking would not translate well. Right? And so one of the things that we've recently been thinking about, we also do career communities and a few other um, concepts that folks have mentioned up on the panel. Um, one of the things we wanted to do was we wanted to see if we could get some of the basic information to our students at scale so that all of the personalized attention that we were able to give them that they expect and that they engage with us for multiple times throughout the year over their four years could be much more tailored to what it was they were looking for, right? And so what we did was we launched our new website just a couple of, uh, couple of weeks ago. And when you go, what it allows you to do is completely customize the experience for you. So it asks you, who are you? and what are you here for, right? So for example, it would say I am, and you could choose student, alumna, um, employer, parent, faculty, whomever. So let's say I am a student. And then the next set of questions that would come up, that would come up on the screen, would be like, I'm a student freaking out. I'm a student who doesn't know what to do. I'm a student who needs money, right? And so we purposely chose things that are relevant to what our students are feeling right now. And when you click on that, all of a sudden you get a whole screen full of cards that are customized to information that you need if you are freaking out right now. Because if you're freaking out and you go to the Career Center's website, you're not gonna know how to navigate the website. You don't know what you're searching for because you're freaking out, right? So instead, we've taken care of that for you and given you the information that you need. And this is the information we think you need right now. And when you go to your career communities and you actually search for information, what we've done, we also partner with Handshake and People Growth, is we've created hundreds of RSS feeds that if you click on jobs or internships or you click on deadlines or whatever the case may be, you can hit the hashtag that's relevant to whatever it is your interest is, and the RSS feed completely changes everything that you see on our website and on our screen so that now the jobs and internships that you're searching for are relevant to what it is you're interested in and what you're looking to do. And when you click on that, it's a seamless transition right into Handshake or right into People Grove so you can now chat with alums that could give you more advice about that or you can apply directly um, for those pieces. So what we've discovered just in the past couple of months is um, this is meeting the need that we were thinking about. Um, we've been really pleased with our digital interaction with our students. We've been able to reach 97% of our full student body digitally um, at this point. And we've been able to reach about 75% of our student body in person um, for this year. Our goal is obviously 100. Um, and so we're excited that we're able to use technology and to use some of the partners that we have here at this conference to be able to help us leverage some of those pieces, but to use that as a way to integrate, right, the learning that they're going to be doing across, um, across the campus. And just to, um, Farouk, if you don't mind, I'll just tag on one other thing. You had mentioned the piece about curriculum and, um, and how this is embedded into the academic experience. And again, I think this is where you have to listen so carefully to the culture of your campus and what works. Um, when I was at George Mason, we were one of the first institutions there that had launched career courses. There were three levels of career courses. There were multiple sections. There were hundreds of students that took it every semester. And that was very normal. That was expected. It was encouraged of the students. I'm now at a liberal arts institution where something like that would not be expected nor necessarily encouraged in that same way. My faculty very much care about our students. They care about their well-being. They care that they're successful afterward, but they don't care about having career courses. <laughs> and so we had to think about that a little bit differently. So I worked with a couple of faculty members um, to pilot some courses where we're embedding career concepts into discipline-rich courses. So these are courses where it might be about women in the workplace and it's based in sociology. And so the students are lear learning sociology theory, they're reading the books and disciplines of their major or of that particular area, but now there's concepts of career readiness that's also embedded into what they're learning so that they're preparing themselves. We have the same thing with um, an English professor and a Japanese professor who are talking about technical writing, but the students are learning 19th century English and 19th century poetry from Japan while they're integrating some of those career concepts. And so for me, I think that's an, a really interesting way of thinking about how career can be embedded um, in a liberal arts setting, for example. And then my last point to the whole integration um, piece around academics is I think you also have to think structurally about how you can really integrate into the conversations. Um, so for me at Wellesley, we knew that the faculty would be a really influential uh, component. And so I wanted to make sure that I had voting rights in academic council. 
so that I could bring legislation um, to, the, to the council, to board, so that I could create an advisory committee that I knew would be influential, would have faculty appointed to it, and more importantly, for me, it wasn't the creation of just the council. I could do that with or without um, being a voting member, but I wanted it because I knew that if faculty were appointed through that avenue, that their service would count towards their tenure and their promotion which means something in terms of um, the carrot and how the institution is, the system, how the system is structured. So I think it's important if you're thinking about integration to acknowledge the ways in which your systems work um, so that you can find ways to embed yourself into that fabric of the institution. Thanks for, thanks for making me feel bad about the work I'm doing in Rochester. <laughs> um, uh, I, I just wanna go back to the scale point, which I think is really interesting as, as Cindy and Christine were talking about this. Um, I think sometimes when we think about scale, we think about depersonalization of, of services. Yeah. But I think the really interesting opportunity we have is that we're scaling certain pieces in order to enhance the relationship Correct. that we can have with yep. um, different people within the ecosystem that we're building. So whether it's alumni experts that we're pulling back into the institution sometimes that maybe we're disengaged or never engaged, mm -hmm. um, or if it's faculty member, or if it's you know other students peer to peer, um, or employers, I think we have an opportunity to almost uh, ex expand the number of relational pieces. Because at the end of the day, I think what we're trying to do in education is still have a human interaction, right? I think people learn best when there's some sort of interaction with people. And I think we have an opportunity to leverage a lot of the technology in order to build more of those relationships. Um, and I think if you're starting out with the scaling question, I feel like that has to be very central to the conversations. If you think about what well, can we just offload that I don't want my advisors to do anymore, I think that's kind of always gonna end in a not good place because the students will eventually disengage sure. because there's no relationship or there's no uh, value to like the humanness mm -hmm. yeah. of, of the interaction. Um, so I feel like that's a critical piece that we're trying to figure out is how do we enhance the relationship with an advisor or a mentor or a coach through technology as opposed to just replacing. And we had this conversation with our staff and the first thing they did, they out, we outlined all the different opportunities that, could, that technology could afford us for scaling and then they immediately had a knee jerk and said, but I don't think these are good ideas because then I don't know where I'm, what my job's gonna be. So there's an identity piece here that I think that was really relevant. Um, and so we had to kind of really digest that and what that meant and then how do you sort of integrate that into whether it's curriculum or whether it's you know, kind of into the services that you're providing. But the scaling piece is a really fascinating piece, uh, element of this discussion and how it's implemented. I'll just tie this in a bow and say integration is the mother of all scale. If, if, if you want to scale something really well, connect into an existing ecosystem and it'll scale up just like that, right? The, the thing that keeps me up at night is that usually um, in 99% of cases, nothing about career services on a campus is mandatory. You have to take classes. You have, you have, there's a lot of things that are, are systemically mandated, but career learning is, is nine times out of 10 not. And so when you integrate into that system, then it scales up and it, it hooks into the, the mandated aspects of the institution, I think that. It's a good hashtag. Too. So, <laughs> good hashtag, <thank> you. <laughs> all of these are uh, all of what you all have mentioned as, uh, are great advice. I want to take it back to the student. Um, is enrolled on campus. That uh, the, the student comes to campus as a freshman, and uh, uh, does not. N the challenge is that that the student does not know where the access points are because it's not mandatory, uh, because it's it might not be integrated into uh, uh, other things. So. How could, it, how could uh, this journey towards meaningful work be more obvious to students early on, that they don't have to struggle in order to have access to all of the resources that are being built to them? Some of these resources are from your career centers. A lot of these resources are outside of your career centers. Um, there's a lot that happens outside of the classroom. There's study abroad that happens outside of the classroom. There is engagement in student organizations. There is volunteering. There are part-time jobs. There are internships. There are things that happen within the career center. And none of that is really obvious for a freshman who comes, comes to campus and is not sure how to tie it all together. Um, that continues to be a fundamental challenge for college students today. And because of the way we are structured, um, it's, it's hard for students to access it. So all of you made this point. How do we move forward from here? How do we make, how do we put this back in uh, the hand of the student to be able to, 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 to um, um, 
manage that that journey uh, in an easier way. Is technology the solution? Um, is changing policy? Is uh, we do we change curriculum? What what do you think? We have to change job descriptions for one. I mean, I don't think it's a magic bullet, but you know, if if uh, the job title is only coach and it's not at least 15 to 20 percent train the trainer then the people that lead the study abroad office don't wake up every day and say I'm going to put career reflection assignments into this study abroad experience and students are going to have a meaningful uh, thoughtful experience so I think the umbrella of uh, you're the trainer of career thoughtfulness embedded in the job description could be one of those dimensions that could help mm -hmm. Interesting. I think it starts before they're even getting to campus right and, and I think this really depends on the type of institution you are, whether you're you know, flagship large public institution, um, if you're you know, obviously elite uh, private institution, I just wanna make sure I got that right. Um, so, or if it's you know, community college, you know, or some of the other sort of diversity of institutions that exist, um, what is, you know, what's the conversation that's had in the admissions process for juniors in high school thinking about this as their next step? You know, how are, they, how are we really painting the picture of what career education is and how that fits to their goals? And I think that, that requires us to a degree to listen to students, which is oddly not always our strength in higher education, and kind of really listening to what the rhythms that they're looking for, and what's our, what's our mission, what's the population we're looking to serve. So I think how integrated is there so that they almost arrive to campus um, with the expectation that I'm looking for this. Because um, to, to your point, Farouk, like, there's no access point, but if we start almost training them to look for it when they get to campus, they start to see it. Because I think many of our students, I think we, they're much savvier than some, we sometimes give them credit for. Mm. And I think we, it's in that admissions process, and not the admissions, like the admissions process of what admissions likes to talk about, of like, you know, 97% of our students have jobs when they graduate, because that almost puts us this idea in their head that it's about graduation, it's about the end point. Mm -hmm. But what we're starting to talk about is how does it integrate it into the, the, the life, because like, they always talk about like how many clubs and organizations are on campus. This is pretty much a standard like admission story, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we start to embed it deeper in that? And that's the front line of the conversation. That takes a lot of sort of, mm -hmm. you know, prioritization. Um, but I think that's, that's part of it. I think what Jeremy talked about is definitely an element of it. Um, so there's no, one solution, it's almost a multi sort of faceted sort of solution that we have to tackle with. I think our students don't, to Joe's point, I don't think our students understand how much they need to own this yeah. process as well, right? So I regularly am out meeting with alums and parents and I always get the question from parents, what do I need to say to my daughter to get her to come in and see you? And I was recently in Silicon Valley in Palo Alto talking to a bunch of parents and they asked this question and I said, well, maybe try this analogy. And I've recently tried this with our students, but I said, tell your daughter that we're a lot like their Pandora or Netflix account. The more she uses us, the more we'll learn her and the better recommendations we can make. Mm. But if she doesn't engage with us, we can't really help. <laughs> and I think that's true. And our students often expect that everything's going to be tailor-made and handed to them in a way that is actually not possible if they don't engage with us. They have a certain level of responsibility that they have to, um, that they have to engage. And one time isn't enough, right? Just like it's not enough for Netflix either. And so I think that's something that we're not always as good um, at telling our students when we're pitching them in admissions or when we're talking to them in orientation. We're so focused on, oh, but we offer all these things to you, but we don't yet say, and this is what we need you to do in return. And so I think it's, it's both and um, in, in that respect. I think the other piece um, to what Jeremy was saying was around the train the trainer is think about where the trusted networks are on your particular campus and where the students naturally go. Don't fight your system, right? Like your, your ecosystem already works a particular way. Just figure out where those points are. Is it the RAs? Do you have a first year mentor program that's peer run? Who is it on your campus that the students naturally flock to? And figure out how you can engage them in a, in a process to understand some of the basics so that the messaging and those access points are really, really clear. Um, and I'll just, I'll do a little pitch for Jeremy. Next week, he actually has um, a, a webinar with um, my former associate director, now the director at George Mason, who's gonna talk about one of the programs that we did um, when, we, when I was there a few years ago called the Career Influencers Network, but it's around this whole concept of figuring out who your trusted network is and then how do you go in and train and 
add those people as essentially your career champions on campus so that you can get this work out more consistently and at scale. They have 150 faculty and staff who went through three module training to say we, we're ready to have great career conversations with students and able to refer them to the right resources. So mm -hmm. it's, pow it's a powerful thing. Yeah, just started. Um, for, for the uh, investors and um, tech startups in the room um, who are thinking about um, the pain points that we're experiencing on our college campuses and how they could, uh, try, to, could try to address them, you know, how could, what, what could they be building that could help address some of these pain points, what would you have to say to them? You know, these, are the, these are one, two, or three uh, major pain points that if you were to develop a technology or to develop a product, uh, we would sign up. We would sign on because it will, they would help us out. Um, Cindy is just about to jump off her seat <laughs> because like, I need one. she's I need thinking, one right I have a hundred thousand students, <laughs> I know. and I need, and I have, and I have ten of those pain points, not right. three. <laughs> what I are you just thinking? Share one. Um, I think there is space to play with. So right now, employers engage um, at universities. A lot of times, it's a pay-to-play model, right? So they pay for a seat to be on a dean's council or an advisory board to influence curriculum. That's the high echelon. I'm looking for a product, a technology tool, so that we're able to connect employers. And um, one of our colleagues describes it as uh, larger than a task, smaller than a project that allows for students to have access to experiential education without having to go to a full semester internship, right, and figure out transportation, how to get there, um, but where the employers engage with faculty and students in curriculum design. So that's a pain point I am happy mm. to talk to anybody about <laughs> is how to integrate um, and bring in employers in real world problems that allow for interdisciplinary approaches and conversations and students to work together on teams to be able to solve problems and practice that and misstep with that and, and understand skill sets that they're developing, uh, working alongside employers and getting exposure to different type of industry because a lot of our students um, judge a book by its cover concept, right? And they don't understand all that is afforded to them um, across various industries, sectors, and roles within those spaces. I think it's interesting to look at what we haven't scaled yet, what we've been kind of holding on to. So uh, to answer your question, uh, we have scaled, we've been scaling job postings for years, right? We took, we took the classifieds in the newspaper and put them online, 1999-ish. And uh, we've now, we're, now, we're now scaling alumni connections. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we have scaled uh, event information now. Uh, we have apps about events. Uh, here's what we haven't scaled. Our own expertise, our own career education expertise. We've been hanging on to that as universities, as career centers. I think there's, there's only one, maybe, maybe two uh, that are, it's happening in the, you know, Pearson and a bunch of others outside of higher ed, outside of career centers, but to have a career, a career education uh, online training platform that to scale that is massive. There, there is a set of curriculum that career centers want to teach students that's 50 to 60 deep. And right now, the method is come see us. And scaling that, I think, is a big deal. I think mm. the scaling also, Jeremy, is to, we talked a lot about partners around campus and how do we like increase our surface area and train other people. So it's scaling that knowledge to all those partners and how do we get them up to speed. I think right now a lot of us rely on um, working with them individually, doing workshops, you know, partnership series, things like that, which I think work well for the, a lot of our campuses. But how do you take all that content and put it someplace where then regardless if where individuals exist in like the leadership, that that content lives and that people can continue to get trained at an institution. I think that's a really interesting space. So it's taking that, and, and because I think that's the people we want to educate, because those are the people that maybe can sustain it at an institution, because the students are going to leave, and then they might, we want them to give it back eventually. But if we're not training the people at the institution, those people will flip, you know, train out, and then how do we, like, we, we lose. We have to do it every, like, you know, often. Yep. Um, and I think that that could be a way to, like, sort of expand that even further. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other ideas? I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll give mine. Um, I would, <laughs> I would love to when see. So I'll give my idea. I'm, I'll self-moderate. Um, I would Fruit, love to. <laughs> I would love to see uh, uh, one of uh, our tech friends 
develop an app for the student, uh, college student journey that's outside of the classroom, the outside of the classroom journey. Um, so all of the things that we talked about, all of, the, all of what happened outside of the classroom, integrated with the, the classroom, that's fine. So oh, you're not just your major when you come to college. Um, you have so many experiences, and um, um, how do you connect all of that? Um, and as a freshman, how can you navigate, the, you know, so something that gives the student a map that navigates all of these resources and connects them um, with an ultimate learning outcome? Um, I would love to see that at some point. Maybe I'll develop it, I don't know. <laughs> um, so uh, we have a few minutes left. I would. Um, um, I was talking with uh, a parent yesterday who, was, uh, who did a um, college tour with his, with his daughter, and he said that none of the campuses that they visited uh, mentioned anything about careers or career centers or career services um, in their admissions tours. Um, if you are uh, one of those parents, or if, you just, if I walk into a college campus, give me a few words uh, that I either see on websites or in buildings or in conversations with people uh, that would signal to me that this is a campus that highly prioritizes career education. What would you like to see? Well, I think you mentioned a word already, career education. I think um, that's a newer term that we're certainly using more of um, across colleges and universities versus uh, career, the career center, career counseling, career development. Um, and I think it just connotes that this is an educational process and it's something that your student needs to also engage in, right? I think that's a big piece. I think Cindy mentioned um, a lot earlier um, in our panel today around career communities, around ecosystem, integrated learning. I think those are all some common terms that you would definitely hear around mm -hmm. a campus that's doing, moving in the right direction. Good. I think facilitating connections. Uh, I think at the core of a lot of our work, I, I think we've all referenced it to a degree, but we're trying to facilitate, connect, facilitate connections between either its concepts, so like outside of inside the classroom, uh, with people, whether it's corporations or, mm -hmm. or alumni um, that we have or institutions, um, or opportunities themselves. And so I think it's using technology, it's using um, you know, live interaction with people, bringing people to campus, taking students off of campus, out of campus, doing it virtually. Um, so I feel like that facilitation of connections around you know, career, I, I think is critical. And I think that's more and more our job, what our responsibilities are. Um, and especially within a career office mm -hmm. is to do more of that. I think that's critical. What, what would tell me it's a priority on your campus? <laughs> Unavoidable in the classroom. Okay. I do think positioning and a seat at the table. Yeah. I, part of the language, uh, you know, part of the, um, the language of the senior administrator. So if there's a welcoming remark by the mm -hmm. dean or the president, it's embedded, um, either explicitly embedded, not like it's like implied. passive or implied. Yeah, I, I think it's kind of ex explicitly talked about in a way that is uh, holistic as opposed to just like, oh, by the way, 97% of our students get jobs after graduation. Um, so I think that, that language is key. I think career and curriculum is key. Um, you know, it's parent orientation season right now um, at a lot of our universities and the conversation with parents and things that they want to know about is um, job market. They want to know how are we preparing students? How can they be involved in the process? Um, and I think a big part of that too is showcasing what employers are connected to universities um, and how are we engaging alumni and them as parents in the places where they work and how they can give back to the university as well besides financial dollars. Mm. Very good. Um, last question. Um, if you are president of a university, we won't say yours uh, uh, since this <laughs> no. is being filmed. <laughs> what is your first action? The first thing that you would do to um, uh, ensure that uh, your college students are uh, prepared for the, for the future of work. Uh, that you, the first action that you do to, to prioritize this, to do it well, and to guarantee uh, that uh, your students are on the path towards meaningful work. Five to seven percent of the entire university budget goes toward intentional career education. What is it now? I don't know, but I think parents would flip their lid if they knew what the number was. I think you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's under 1% when you think about intentional. 
career education initiatives, intentional career development. I think there's a definite unintentional argument to be made that every classroom is going to help you in some way, but from an intentional perspective, I think I think it's quite low. Yep, five to seven percent like would that. be good. Five to seven percent. That, that's I think that's low, but yeah. I think that's a humongous start. start. There. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Uh, first and foremost, I would hire the right person. I don't think any of the initiatives, any of the things that we're talking about, the kind of integration that we want at scale can happen without the right kind of forward thinking, um, somebody who's hungry and driven and boundary pushing. So I'd get the right person in place, then I would do the budget. <laughs> I think I'm a big believer in strategic plans, and I think it's got to be part of the university's like five-year strategic plan of how this will be embedded and integrated. I think that's a critical piece of it. Funding um, and somebody who is a dedicated champion for driving career readiness across the entire university. Very good. And with that, I want to thank you all for some amazing insights. And I want to thank all of you for participating with us for the last hour. It's been great.